Uh, today we, we are here with Professor Francisco Rochinol from Universidade Estadual de Campinas, Unicamp. So it's closer to São Paulo. Professor Rochinol got his bachelor and his PhD in physics in Unicamp, uh, Universidade Estadual de Campinas. He also got a, did a postdoc in Syracuse University in, in the United States. And nowadays, he is one of the leaders of the biggest project we have in Brazil to build our own qubits in superconducting devices. So together with people from Rio de Janeiro, Ivan de Oliveira, who will be here in the afternoon, they are building our qubits, superconducting qubits. And this is the topic of his lectures. So thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Please take your time. Thank you very much, Celso. First, I'd like to thank you for the invitation here. Uh, I really appreciate to be in front of you guys today to discuss a little bit about my field. OK, uh, in this mini course, I want to talk uh, a little bit about the devices I work in our lab. Okay. Uh, different from other uh, researchers, I do experimental physics there. Okay, we build the devices and we test the devices in the lab. And we are trying to do the qubits, the, all the circuit here in Brazil. Most part of the, our effort in the lab is to build the equipment and the softwares and the algorithms necessary to develop this technology. Okay. So how do we start doing that? First thing we did was to send a proposal to FAPESP to get some money to buy the equipment. Because this is a very expensive field. The equipments are really expensive and really hard to work with. Oh, well, we started in 2017, by the end of 2017, but we really started the project in 2018. And we started to build a lab, like get this space remove everything from the old lab there and build a new lab with all the infrastructure necessary to uh, run the equipments we need. Because we are an experimental uh, group, we had to uh, build a new uh, electrical system for the lab because uh, these uh, superconducting circuits are really sensitive to the environment. They, are really con uh, they interact really strongly with the environment. So we had to build a new kind of uh, clean lines to be able to uh, provide the energy necessary to run the equipment. With the lab uh, prepare, we start to buy, to project and buy the equipment. Okay? And then the first equipment we need is an equipment to make the qubits. Okay? I will show you guys in a... Uh, few slides, the lab. But the first part is how can we build a qubit? That's the first answer we had to do in this project. And to do that, we are using a superconducting technology, a Josephson junction, that are basically two superconducting wires connected by an isolant uh, barrier. So we uh, call some companies, OK, I need to make this kind of equipment. I want this part of equipment here, that part here, and that part there. And we are going to put everything together in a machine that I, I can uh, teach my students to work with this machine. And that's what we did. We sent to the company with the money from FAPESP. They built the machine, and they sent the machine to Brazil. And the machine arrived here in the airport. And what happened? Someone working uh, in the airport dropped the machine on the ground. Okay. It's a $400,000 machine, and after that, the machine is not working. It's not possible to use the machine. Then, okay, we need to solve that problem. We call for PASP, we call the insurance, uh, talk with everyone. And with that, it was like a couple of years trying to uh, solve the problem. And in the end, after a year, this 
uh, talking with the insurance company and FAPESP, they decide, okay, uh, we are, FAPESP, we are going to have to destroy the machine, uh, and then I will give you the money to buy a new one. Okay? Then some guys went to the lab with some big saws and some hammer, hammers and start to uh, destroy the machine. At that moment, okay, I cannot be here. I went away at the other point, okay. Then I got the money to buy a new one, and then, okay, let's uh, buy a new machine. And I called the company again, the guys, okay, I need a new machine for you guys because the last one I had to destroy because someone dropped the machine in the middle of the airport. And the guys uh, start to build a new machine. And to build a machine like that, it's not like I get, uh, go to the market, get the machine, and go home. It took a year to make the machine again. So it's more than one year to make the machine and then send back, uh, send the machine to Brazil. The machine arrived here in the middle of 2020. Okay, it was the pandemic here, it was uh, like everything was crazy. FAPESP didn't want to deliver the machine to us. I called FAPESP, okay, I need the machine here. Do something and send the machine here. And then the FAPESP, okay, going to do that, but I'm not responsible to anything because it's, we have the pandemic here in Brazil, we cannot be responsible for the machine. I told them, no problem, send the machine here. Then the machine arrived in my lab, and you can think, it's not like a machine this size. It's something like three and a half meters by two and a half meters tall, and like one and a half meters wide. And the weight is something like 1.2 tons. So, 1,200 kilograms. And, okay, machine is here, uh, company, can you come here to uh, assemble all the pieces? The, uh, the company, no. We are in the middle of the pandemic, pandemic. We cannot send any technician to Brazil to assemble the machine. I told, okay, uh, can I assemble the machine? The guys, can you do that? I told the guys, yes. When I was a grad student here, I worked with uh, vacuum technology. I did this kind of assembly before. I think I can do that. Uh, the company told me, okay, let's do that one piece uh, by week, and then we're going to build this machine in, uh, in some, a couple of months. Uh, the, um, the company sent to me, okay, first step, do that. And then I went there, removed the machine from the crate. It's a 1.1200 kilograms machine, so I have to move the machine from the crate. Then, okay, I cannot do this by myself. I call one of my PhD students, come to the lab. <laughs> I need your help here, man. <laughs> um, the student was uh, Lucas, and uh, he came to the lab, and then we start to build the uh, assemble the machine. And we are uh, exchanging uh, emails with the company. And then the couple of months took us six months to assemble the machine by email. Because every time we did, did something, the, the company, okay, now install this, this piece, now that piece. And all, after that was like six months assembled machine. Then, okay, machine is uh, assembled. Let's uh, do all the programming to uh, pay, put the machine to work. And then we start to do all the programming with the guys. Uh, it took us like a week to do that, because that was kind of fast. I knew most part of the uh, uh, documents inside of the machine was kind of easy. Then the machine was working, everything was fine. We could start the tests of the machine. So what's the importance of this uh, part of the history here, I told you, that uh, many courses that I did when I was undergrad and a grad student was, were really important in this moment. Because was some of the techniques I never thought would be useful for me during my uh, work as a professor. That moment, okay, this is important. That stuff that I didn't know why I was doing that, that moment uh, appeared to me, okay, this is important now because some moment if something goes wrong, you know uh, where you have, have to go to find the answer, okay? And the other part of the history that's important is that when you have a problem, you start to call everyone 
and complain about the problems. Talk with, with someone, ask questions, talk with the guys to uh, try to solve your problem. Okay? Don't let your problem become really big and then you cannot have a way to solve in the end. Okay? Okay. So the first part of the problem was to have a machine that can make these Josephson junctions that are the heart of the uh, qubit technology with superconducting circuits. The other equipment that we need that are really important is a dilution refrigerator. Okay. What's a dilution refrigerator? It's a big fridge that we can produce in one part of this machine a really low temperature and a really quiet uh, electromagnetic environment. So in this machine, we can uh, reduce the temperature of the environment there to temperatures around 10 milli K. Okay? And we can keep this machine running for long periods of time, like six months, a year, without problems. We can turn on the machine and keep the machine running for this uh, long period of time. So what we did, okay, I called some guys I knew from IBM, uh, uh, Google, BBN, that are working with this kind of technology. And uh, I said, guys, what's the best company today to do this kind of uh, equipment? And they told, okay, we have a company in Finland that are making the best equipment today. So let's call the company and let's make a project that can fit inside of my budget of a PESP to do this kind of uh, uh, environment for my sample. Then we call the company, we start to discuss all the possibilities. I want that, I want this, I want this equipment, that equipment. And all of this development of the, uh, the fridge uh, passed for a understanding of what's the uh, heat load from one uh, part of the refrigerator to the other. And it uh, isolated uh, thermically uh, one part of the fridge for the other. Because I have 300 Kelvin ar around the environment in my lab, but inside of the place I have this, my qubit, my circuit, I need a really low temperature and a really quiet electromagnetic environment. So what we, do, we need to uh, go, open the thermodynamics book, look, okay, I have this metal here and that uh, polymer here. What's the uh, heat load I have for each one of these devices here? I will put a cable here, how much heat load this uh, cable will bring from this stage that's running at uh, 1K to this stage that's running at 100 milli K. And then uh, now I have this same cable going from 100 milli K to 10 milli K. How much heat I'm going to pass through this cable from one stage to the other stage? Then with this calculation, okay, this is the heat load. I have this first part done. Now I have the second part. I need to uh, prepare the signal I have at room temperature and send this signal from room temperature to low temperature. And you have, if you remember from uh, thermodynamics again, if you have uh, some noise at room temperature, the noise will be at temperature of 300K. If you send this signal with this 300K directly to 10 milli K, the noise of the 300 Kelvin will be much bigger than the signal we are trying to look. So we, ha we have to uh, think about, okay, how can I reduce this noise coming from room temperature, going down to all the stages of my refrigerator until the, my uh, sample, and this noise is small enough to not uh, damage my my quantum state inside of my uh, chip. So we, again, uh, thermodynamics and some uh, electromagnetism, we did some calculations. Okay, I need to add this kind of uh, attenuators to reduce the noise from the uh, signals I have at room temperature and send the signal to my sample. Then we did that, called the company, okay, Let's do this uh, equipment this way, this way, that way. And the company, okay, I have this other equipment here that can help you with that, with that. We did some more work and then we went there and, okay, we have what we need now. I called the company, uh, well, that was in 2018, beginning of 2018. Okay, this is the equipment I want. You can send me that. 
Then the company, okay, I need one year, one year and a half to make the uh, equipment, and you need to buy helium-3. Because this equipment works with a mixture of uh, isotopes of helium. You, have, you need helium-3 and helium-4 to make the uh, low temperature where you have your sample. And it's not easy to buy helium-3, okay? And it's so expensive that the people are thinking to go to the moon, get some helium-3 there we have in the moon and bring to Earth, okay? And the best part, uh, most part of the companies that uh, prospect oil here in South America, they have a helium-3 uh, coming from the ground and they just throw this in there. In our case, our helium came from uh, Russia. Russians uh, sell to England, the England sell to Finland, and Finland uh, sell to us. So our helium-3 came from uh, Russia to Brazil to uh, cool down uh, our, uh, help to cool down our system. So what we do to cool down this uh, refrigerator here? What, what we have that, uh, when helium-3, helium-4, uh, when you reduce the temperature of helium-3, helium-4, they start first to condense at, in a liquid form around 4 Kelvin. Then uh, helium-3 condense uh, around 3.2 Kelvin, and then you have two fa uh, one phase between helium-3 and helium-4. When the temperature goes below 0 0.86, 0 0.9 Kelvin, helium-3 and helium-4 start separating two phases. One phase that's rich in helium-4, other phase that is rich in helium-3. And helium-4 is more, uh, have more dense, uh, is a, uh, has a higher density than helium-3. Then helium-4 goes to the bottom of my fridge, and helium-3 uh, helium goes to the top of my fridge. And then I have a separation of phases. I have a phase uh, on the bottom you know, with helium-4, a phase on the top with helium-3, and I start to evaporate helium-3 in helium-4. So that is a little more complicated than that. We need some quantum mechanics to explain what's happening. But the idea is that you are uh, evaporating helium-3 inside of helium-4. When you do that, you uh, remove heat from the, your uh, mix, mi mixture. And then you start to pump helium-3 from the other side. Then you repeat this for a long period. And then you can reduce the temperature from uh, 0.5 Kelvin, 1.8 Kelvin to 10 millik. Mm -hmm. With that, we uh, start to have the uh, main part that is our equipment that can produce this low temperature and all the cables to bring the signals from room temperature to the sample to measure the sample. Then, okay, this two second part is done. Then we have the third part of uh, is that we need some equipment to control our qubit. We need a way to uh, uh, manipulate the qubit and a way to measure the qubit. So to do that, we need uh, sources or uh, some kind of equipment that can produce a signal that when I send this signal to my sample, they will make the qubit uh, change the uh, state from state that I can call ground state to a state that can I call excited state. I want to make a transition in the qubit that you modify the qubit from the ground state to the uh, excited state. Okay, and we knew how to do that because we uh, looked some papers, some uh, PhD thesis, and the guys developed that technology many years ago, and they knew how to do that. So we start to buy these equipment that high, uh, microwave sources, RF sources, and DC sources that you be able uh, to send the signals from room temperature, that from a computer that they can make a program. You control these machines. The machines, you create the signals the way I want. The signals will move through the cables I prepare. The signal will arrive to the sample and you uh, do the modification in the qubit and the other rest of the circuitry I have inside to make the measurement. Okay. So we did all of that, bought the uh, this equipment, and 
This is, was one of the most expensive parts. That part was around $450,000. Sorry, the uh, refrigerator was more expensive, it was 560. And it's a small one. Today they sell bigger ones that's around 1.2 million. So we bought all of this equipment, put that in a rack, and put a computer together. I got a PhD student, okay, sit here and start to do the programming. Start to uh, learn how to control the machines, how to uh, create the signals we want to do all the operations we want inside of the, uh, the qubit. <coughs> so that's the uh, three parts uh, we need to do the qubit. And there is a, the last part is, how can we make this device? How can we uh, get a Hamptonian that describes the interaction of a microwave cavity with a qubit and then uh, create a circuit, a electrical circuit, that will have this kind of properties. So uh, we start to, again to read the papers and read some PhD theses. And they have the, all the details there, the, what they did before. Okay, this is what we need. Let's uh, try to build one of these devices. So what we did is, let's back get our uh, electromagnetism book. Look how can we create a, a quark cell cable here that we, if we uh, put capacitors here, inductors here, uh, we can make an LC circuit, a resonator, a harmonic oscillator that will behave like a, a quantum uh, harmonic oscillator. Then we go in there and calculate the capacitance, inductances, all the, the prop electrical properties of the circuits. Okay, this is the way I have to build, design my circuit to have the properties I want. I want to decide, okay, what's the energy of this circuit? Because I want to be able to send a signal that you excite this transition in this uh, harmonic oscillator. Okay, I went there, I could uh, do some calculations. I created this first uh, harmonic oscillator. Second part, I need to build the qubit. And probably you guys already know, there are many different flavors of qubits. Every day I see a different, different flavor of qubit around the world. Someone, okay, if we modify this and that, I can call this a fluxonium, a uh, bus eye, uh, uh, transmon, or whatever. I, okay, let's work with some more classical kinds of qubits. Let's work with the transmon and, uh, and fluxoniums. This transmon is more, I think it's more easy to understand. It's basically a LC circuit that we have a, a capacitor and the inductor, where the capacitor is basically two uh, flat, flat parts of metal, but instead of be one on top of the other, they are one of the side of the other. They are this way, not this way. Okay, we build uh, the capacitor. We went there to some, uh, did some simulations. And in some uh, software console or, or, or whatever. And we did, okay, that's the uh, capacitance I have here. Now I need to build the second element, the, the inductor. But because I want a qubit, I need the inductor that's not linear. They will not be, have this linear behavior that the inductor has, that with the, uh, the current and the inductance are proportion, directly, directly proportional one to the other. I want something that I can modify when I increase the current, the inductance does have a linear behavior. And the element that we use to do that is the Josephson junction. The, you can think that in, for some applications that a Josephson junction is an inductor that's no linear, okay? So they, you modify the uh, behavior of this harmonic oscillator, that's a LC circuit, to a non-harmonic oscillator. With that, the energy levels of this harmonic oscillator you be not, you not be equal, they'll be different. So when I excite one of the, uh, the ground state to the first excited state, I am not exciting the second uh, level of the qubit to the third level. I'm only exciting the first two levels of the qubit. So we went there, okay. Now what's the inductance I need in this junction? to create a qubit that has a specific energy that will be near of my first cavity, that will be able to couple these two uh, devices together. 
And then we did there, we load the critical current we can pass to the junction, and we imagine, okay, with that we can uh, create this device. Then we did some calculations, I needed this kind of normal resistance for my junction, this kind of area for to have this current, and this is basically what we need to do. Then we need to now print this in a circuit, electrical circuit. We need to do, go to the uh, equipment and print this and make the electro, uh, electric circuit in a ship with superconductor materials. So we went to some uh, facilities here in Brazil. Some of these facilities are, we have facilities here in uh, Atuni Camp, USP, uh, CTI in Campinas as well. We have uh, in Sirius, they have inside of the facilities of Senepeng uh, some equipments that are able to do this kind of printing. CBPF is other place, they have this kind of equipment to do this kind of printing. So we went to all of those labs and start to uh, learn how to make a recipe that to be able to build, to co build or uh, construct our device inside of a uh, thin film of uh, niobium. We decided to use niobium as our superconductor. Then we, after some years working with the recipe, trying to uh, buy uh, new polymers, new equipment to make this uh, circuit to be printed in the sample, we went there and we decided, okay, now we have everything we need. We build the circuit there, we build the qubit, <coughs> we went to uh, the fridge and put the qubit inside, and okay, let's find the qubit. Let's see if the qubit is alive or not. That's the first step. And in the middle of this year, we had the chance to build the first two qubits here in Brazil. We, have a, we produce a, a sample with two qubits inside of a, a microwave cavity. And we started to do some measurements in this uh, qubit for a couple of months, uh, adjusting the software we developed to do the measurements, and uh, see some bugs we had uh, during the fabrication. And I will show you guys some of the measurements we have the sample. Uh, sadly, uh, we had some problems with the sample in the middle of the run and we could not uh, make all the uh, ports we want to do in this, part of, this first part of the project. We want to be able to do uh, pi pulses there, pi over two pulses on the qubits, and do some uh, swap of uh, states between the two qubits. That last part, we had some problems with the uh, sample that is really incredible, because uh, if you get to the sample and put on the air, you can see uh, the qubit blow. It's basically, uh, you can see uh, the qubit burning because of the uh, humidity of the air. But that happens, that's part of the job. We have to run samples, many samples, hundreds of samples until we get a sample that has all the characteristics we want to do the calculations we want. Okay. So uh, now I told you a little bit about this first part. I will start to discuss a little bit what we want to do here, okay? Oh, uh, what, why we are working with superconducting qubits? <coughs> One of the ideas that uh, superconducting qubits can uh, use uh, the same kind of technology we are, going, we are using in the last 60, 70 years to do uh, semiconductors. So all the chips you have on your cell phones, you have on your uh, TVs, on your computers, they are based on semiconductor uh, chips. And what's interesting, that you can use the same technology you use to make semiconductor devices to make superconducting devices. There are some differences in some steps that are important, but in most part, you can use this kind of technology, okay? <coughs> and with this kind of technology, some companies uh, are, uh, were able to make qubits. I think today the highest one is IBM Osprey. I think it was like last month, or they told us that I think it's 433 qubits. It's a really impressive uh, chip. They have many different layers of uh, um, uh, uh, qubits in different uh, uh, chips 
they uh, put together the chips one on top of the other. One, some part of the cavities are in one chip, some part of the line is to excite the qubits are in other chip, and they put everything together inside of a, uh, a processor that can be useful to make calculations. So, and because of the possibility to uh, scale, many companies think that's the best option. Okay? Uh, it's interesting that uh, for us that work in the, uh, in the universities, research labs, we know how to develop like three, four, ten qubits. That's not so hard for us. It's, it's hard to take a long time, many hours of uh, PhD students to make something like that, but something that we are able to do. But when we have to scale that for hundreds, thousands of qubits, companies do that much better. They have much more experience in how to make uh, something that is, works in a lab, in a university, with five, 10 qubits, to work with 1,000, uh, 500, 200 qubits, okay? <coughs> okay, well, uh, in many, uh, many of the technologies to make qubits are based in uh, artificial atoms that what we have in superconducting uh, devices. You can use ions. Silicon, we can use the silicon quantum dots. Uh, we can try to make topological qubits that are uh, other technology that's really uh, improving the last years. And uh, nitrogen vacants in diamond. Okay? All of those uh, technologies are really promising to develop uh, a quantum computer or, tech, or quantum technologies that can be useful to create uh, this new uh, computer that can be solve many different problems that a classical computer cannot. Oh, what do we need to do? Uh, for example, uh, in silicon. Uh, systems that the technology we use to our chips, we can uh, add in the uh, silicon chip some defects in some specific points and put on top of, the, of these defects some electrodes to control the spin of some uh, nuclear uh, phosphor or nuclear uh, defect we have there, or some spin we have in this device. And, uh, Intel is putting a lot of money on that because they know how to uh, work really well with uh, semiconductor devices. So we go in some place, create a defect there in the silicon, create some electrodes around that can control this uh, spin there, and we are trying to use this to create this qubit there. One of the problems of this technology is that it's really hard to uh, create a defect in a specific point in a chip. It's really, uh, it's really hard to control where your defect will be, uh, will grow. So that's the part they are uh, trying to solve in the last years. Uh, that's one of the reasons the guys like uh, superconducting qubits, because you can go to the lab and you can decide, okay, that's are the characteristics I want in my device. And I want to build this device here, that device there, I want to put this qubit in this chip, that cavity in that chip and put everything together. <coughs> okay. And one of the problems uh, with the superconducting qubits is because of they are really big for when you compare that with uh, atoms or defects in uh, different materials. They have something like 100 micrometers, 200 micrometers. So they are really, really large when compared with atoms. And because of that, they interact with everything around or uh, environment. Because of that, they have really short coherence times. And this is something that was a, a really struggle in the beginning of the field. But after many years, um, some groups start to develop techniques to uh, reduce this uh, coherence of the qubit and be capable to keep the coherence long enough that you can apply all the uh, ports you want in the qubit before the qubit loses his coherence. So you, can, you, you are able to 
uh, make some calculation before you lose the quantum information you have in your state. Okay, here's only to give you some, remember you guys, about the main parts we have of the DV Central's criteria about what we, our quantum computer needs, okay? We have uh, read qubits that we know how to build these qubits and something that uh, we can uh, make many of them, okay? You need to be able to uh, create the initial state of the qubit. We want uh, all of those qubits, create the state we want in the beginning of our calculation. Uh, we need coherence time long enough to apply all the ports before we lose coherence in our device. We need some kind of uh, set of gates. We need to uh, know how all the operations necessary to create any kind of operation we want in this kind of device. And we need to be able to measure in the end all the qubits. Okay. Well, that's what we uh, are looking for when I try to develop this kind of uh, quantum computer. Okay. Uh, so, uh, for sure, all of you saw in the beginning that the computers in the beginning are really big machines. Okay. The beginning, we use uh, valves that are really large uh, lamps in the end that uh, are used to make this kind of uh, calculations. You can use uh, classical logic with these circuits, uh, like passing current, not passing current, have a voltage, don't have voltage, to create this kind of uh, classical computers. And there are really big machines in the beginning. And this is something, in some way, similar to what we have in a, a superconducting quantum lab today. Here, uh, on the right here, I have an image of the, our lab there. Okay, you can see. This is the uh, dilution refrigerator here. And each one of these plates here are different stages of uh, my uh, dilution refrigerator in the lab. Here in the bottom is the uh, 10 millik stage. Okay, then I have 100 millik, 1k, 4K and 50 milli K, and then on top, 300 K. And all of these equipments here are here only to send signals and receive the signals back from the qubit to control the qubit. <coughs> here's the uh, fridge is open. You can see uh, then all the parts inside of the fridge. And here is closed with different uh, thermal and electrical shields to uh, isolate the qubit from the rest of the world. Okay. Okay. And here is an image of each one of the stages uh, we have inside of the lab. Okay, or this fridge here. And each one of them have different uh, anchors or different uh, devices to clean the signal that comes from room temperature here on the top to send the signal into uh, our sample, where we can uh, put the signal inside of our sample. Okay. And you, you see here, each one of these stages has an attenuator that reduces in 30 dB here, 6 dB, 10 dB, 20 dB. If you don't, guys don't remember, uh, every 3 dB you reduce by half the power you have in the signal. Okay? So basically, have, every time you reduce 3 dB, you reduce by half the power you have inside of your signal. Then after the signal arrives to your sample, the, you do the operations you have here, the signal needs to go out and come back to room temperature. And because the signal here is really small, we are looking at a really small quantum effect inside of this, uh, in this sample. So we need to send the signal back and amplify the signal by many dBs to send the signal back to the uh, equipment outside to measure the uh, uh, pair the signal with the signal you have in the beginning so we can get information about what you have on your uh, sample, okay? Oh, so what we need 
uh, to create these quantum computers. Besides the classical logic, you already, uh, probably most of you already know, uh, we need uh, superposition, entanglement, and coherent quantum tunneling. Hey, here is the wrapped duck. You guys, uh, I think you guys know that. You guys can see here a duck or a rabbit, depending on how you look. And that's the best thing I found to explain what's superposition. Uh, it's not superposition, uh, all of you know, but you can see the duck or you can see the rabbit. You cannot see both together. At least I never saw anyone that could do that. Okay? So you have both there, but you only can see one when you look. That's not my idea. I got, I got this from other uh, talk many years ago. I forgot the uh, name of the researcher that uh, put that on the talk. Maybe to the end of the talk, I can remember and can give the proper credit here. Okay, so what we are going to do here? We need to engineer uh, these quantum systems, like I told in the beginning, that you have the properties and the energies I want to make in my calculations, okay? And what's interesting that the, uh, these systems, they are, uh, we can, when we build them, they are, we have billions of atoms inside of these systems. It's not only one atom that has this uh, quantum property. It's billions of atoms that behave like a single uh, device that you have the properties I want. And uh, with this kind of circuit, we can study this uh, not only uh, make quantum computation, but we also can study uh, other kinds of quantum mechanical systems and uh, put these quantum circuits with interacting with the other systems to make uh, some fundamental research here. So one of the works we are trying to do in the lab is try to couple these superconducting circuits with uh, solid state uh, materials to try to probe uh, quantum properties of solid state materials, okay? We also can uh, use these devices to uh, simulate it like uh, other systems. For example, uh, we put a paper on archive that we are trying to build a planar uh, system where we have uh, many uh, harmonic oscillators coupled in a way that we can produce uh, hyperbolic lattices in high dimensions. We, can, we are trying to see if we can simulate a uh, uh, three or four dimension uh, div uh, material that has high hyperbolic kind of uh, behavior in the uh, uh, bands they have. Okay, if you guys wanna look, uh, you can see in this kind of reviews some more information about uh, this field. Okay? And probably you can go to the uh, YouTube and find uh, people that you explain much better many of the topics I'm uh, talking here today. Okay, so how I thought to explain today to you guys what we're going to do here. <coughs> what we want to do is uh, create uh, in you an uh, idea of how can we uh, think about superconducting circuits. And the idea I thought is, uh, we're going from cavity QED to circuit QED. Because most of us had uh, cavity QED in our uh, grad courses, so we can have, uh, get some information uh, comparing these two kind of uh, fields, okay? And, uh, what we're going to use, the new elements we're going to use in this circuit QED is the squid, the Jacobson junction, microwave cavities. We can have microwave resonators and have other hybrid systems that we can couple with this system to create this new kind of circuit QED devices. So, here, uh, the first idea is that uh, if you have two mirrors, and we have uh, I put some kind of electromagnetic uh, field inside of this cavity, we can create a, a harmonic oscillator here, okay? And 
we can use atom to probe the state of the field inside of this cavity, or we can do the other way around, that we can put some kind of field inside of this cavity and pass out an atom through the cavity and then measure uh, the cavity again to see how the atom was modified by the field here inside. So we have two ways to think about that. The cavity can be, we can use the atom to probe the cavity, or we can use the uh, cavity to probe the atom. There are two possibilities here. And it depends on what you want to do. And you know, uh, light is the, one of the most incredible uh, seasons we have in nature. It's really, we have it every day around to our, our eyes, but in the end it's really hard to understand, uh, fully understand what is light. Okay? And uh, one of the things we can do is we can use the atom to probe the state of the cavity. Okay? The atom, can, uh, passing, the atom passing through the cavity can be used as a kind of probe for the number state, what the uh, state we have inside this cavity here. Pass the atom through the cavity, then we measure the atom, we have idea of what we have inside here. No, oh, that's a good question. May I answer that in a few slides? Okay. No. Uh, so the idea here is that we pass the atom through the cavity, and the way the atom interacts with the cavity, they will give us, when we probe here the atom, we, you see information about what we have inside, inside of the cavity. And what we want to answer is, can we make some device that is solid state that you, this, you have this kind of a behavior? Then the answer uh, you see is yes, you can. So what, the, what's the idea here? We have an uh, electromagnetic field arriving in a, mic, uh, in a microwave cavity, optical microwave cavity here. And we have atom interacting with these modes of the cavity, with for, uh, and uh, G as a coupling uh, factor. And the cavity has some leak, some signal leaks from the cavity. We have some uh, leak from the atom, some decay from the atom. It, and this kind of uh, system is built something like that. We have a source here of atoms. You have here our cavity. And we have here a way to measure the uh, transitions inside of the atom. So what we do here, we pass the beams of atoms through the cavity. Then we measure uh, the uh, state of the atom to see what kind of transitions you produce on the atom when they pass through the cavity here. So when the atom pass through the cavity, you modify the characteristics of the atom. Then you do some kind of measurement spectroscopy on the atom to see what modification the field inside of the cavity did here. Okay. One atom per time. We are sending like 1,000 atoms, but one per time. And we measure one each time. Okay. And with that, for example, you can do uh, rabbi, uh, oscillations between the cavity and the atom and measure the probability to find the atom here in the excited state as a function of time. Yeah, that's one kind of measurement you can do. Okay. And then we can start to build this uh, thing. Okay, let's build this kind of uh, circuit using superconducting devices. And what's the uh, analogy we can have here? Okay, first thing, uh, this, kind, this line here, you can think that's a, like a coaxial cable, a flat coaxial cable. You make a cut this side, a cut in this side here. And these two cuts here, they are capacitors. They will make our mirror of our, our cavity. And inside of this part, this piece of metal here, you can send signals inside of this device. And the wave, you have this, uh, 
you see these two capacitors, and you can create here a uh, electromagnetic field that has a specific uh, frequency. Okay. And now we have a microwave cavity. We ne need to create an atom, and the atom we, we use here is a superconducting uh, qubit. This superconducting qubit is basically uh, are based on Johnson junctions. That you can see, you can read something about that in the Nakamura paper from 1999. And this is uh, what we call a uh, charge gate uh, qubit, okay, a Cooper pair box. And here we have what we call a transmount here. So here you can see in this pad here and this pad on the bottom, they are the capacitors of my non-harmonic oscillator. And here on the, these two small traces here, you can see a zoom here. These are the Jackson junctions. This gives us the uh, inductor we have in our device, the non-linear inductor we have in our device. And here in the middle, this small part here, here is the barrier where we have here between this piece of metal on the top and this piece of metal on the bottom, uh, oxide that will be our, will be our uh, barrier between the two superconductors. Okay. And with the atom, now we have here atom that you can see here. We have the electromagnetic uh, cavity here with our, our resonator. And now we can couple this atom with this uh, cavity here. Okay, so now you can start to think about our uh, analogy here. The optical microwave cavity here will be now a coplanar wave guide. That's the name of this kind of cavity here. You also can make an inductor and a capacitor and make this same kind of device. But the way the way uh, the electromagnetic field will be inside of a, LC circuit will be a little bit different from this kind of device. But you can uh, use uh, our knowledge about electromagnetism and estimate where will be the maximum of electrical field and there will be the maximum of uh, magnetic field inside our system. Then we have an atom that we are coupling to the electrical field. We are not coupling this atom to the magnetic field in this case. So we are going to put the, the atom on the a maximum of the electromagnetic field. And we are going to interact this atom to this cavity here. It will dipole kind style of interaction. So now we have our atom. It will be this kind of transmon device that will be our artificial atom. Our cavity will be this coplanar wave guide that will be our resonator. And we can couple these two devices uh, in this kind of system. The same way we did in uh, cavity D. Okay. So now we got to the first one of the first points that uh, why do we need superconduct superconductivity? Yep, exactly this way here. Okay, on oh. The, on the oh. Uh, yeah, uh, I can show you here. Okay. Okay. Uh, you see, this is small uh, line here. Okay. The, in the middle, you can see a small line here. This is the cavity. This is the coaxial line you have inside of the system. Okay. It's, okay. Not, it's not the green yellow part. It's this green here? No. Yeah. This is uh, uh, something else that I have in this kind of system for some kind of operation. That's not important right now, okay? okay? Uh, but this line here is my uh, cavity. That's what I have here. This line here, instead of make a straight line, I make this way so I have more space. I can use better the space in my sample, okay? This is an extra line that this line here, I can add a high voltage to the line here. I can have my uh, microwave signal plus a DC voltage on top. I can move uh, just the voltage of my DC line. This is important for some kind of operations 
that are not important right now to understand what's happening here. Uh, so, the length of the wave guide defined, here, five uh, millimeters. And this is what defines the maximum and minimum of the field inside. Oh, the the length of the the line here defines the where is the maximum and the minimum. We are looking for the first uh, mode here. Okay. So it'll be basically something like. Hey, have some input line here. You create a capacitor. Hey, so this is the line I have. The line I have here. I just did in this way here to use better the spacing. Then I will, I don't, I will have like a 11 millimeters line that to be too long. So this way. I can use better the space my sample. Okay, it's really expensive each one of these chips. So to make a, a wafer, you'll be something like fifty or sixty thousand dollars. Oh, you need to use very well the space. Oh, this kind of line, you can think about this line this way here. This is a series of inductors. Okay, with <coughs> Shunt capacitors here. Okay. Now you can get uh, your electromagnetism book, solve this kind of circuit, and find the equation of, uh, that describes the electromagnetic field inside of this circuit. It took you, took you like three or four pages to do that. It's not really hard. Okay. <laughs> they can do that. <laughs> Everyone here uh, needs to have the experience to, okay, I need to do that one time in my life to really know how to do it. Okay. So you, you think like this way, this is the line I have here, this line here. And what am I do, doing here? I'm adding to my system here, in this point, a second capacitor. So, in some point here, let me choose this one here. Oh, let me put here and other capacitor. This point here, I'm adding my qubit here. This I'm doing it. In some point, instead, I, I'm removing the capacitor here to the ground, I'm adding a capacitor and the junction to the ground. And again, I'm going with the same equation I did before, add this new element to the circuit, solve this, and you can use Lagrangian and Hamilton in here. Okay, uh, we don't need to use uh, solve this uh, directly. You can use everything you, you learn about uh, uh, mechanics, classical mechanics, and use uh, here and do the same kind of uh, calculation you do for, uh, you get the kinetic energy and the potential energy here of this circuit, calculate the Lagrangian of the system, and then do the calculation for the Hamiltonian of the system. I will show you guys that in, uh, in some slides. Okay, so. Okay, so I still have one question. And so the analogous of your uh, photon in your cavity, you're controlling the voltage in this, in the borders of the circuit, or what is it? Yes. I, I was thinking, how do, you, how do you get an electromagnetic field in, this, in the middle if you don't have, if it's oh. not connected, right? It's connected. I have here a surf that produces some kind of um, wave come here. I have a capacitor. When I have oh. a, 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 a mm. AC signal, they pass through the capacitor. And then I have some kind of circuit creating this kind of elect electrical field here. Okay, so okay. you have to tune your, your uh, font yeah. to have the exact uh, wave uh, exact, The frequencies. I, I'm doing a, I uh, pass through the frequencies. Mm -hmm. The same way, I don't know if you did this, uh, when you see uh, LC circuit, on when you do an uh, undergrad course of 
uh, electronics, you have LC circuit, you change the frequency of the source and see that some moment you have a maximum of transmission of the circuit. It's exactly the same thing here. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, okay. And the electrical, uh, the uh, magnetic field will be something like this way. Okay. Okay, thank you. So the idea here that uh, this kind of circuit here, you can think that this is, is something similar with So oh, this part here represents all the inductors and capacitors here. And you have some kind, this is coupled. Oh, sorry, here I need to put a capacitor here. And this LC circuit is coupled to this, uh, the qubit here. So it's basically two harmonic oscillators coupled in some specific form. We are coupling two harmonic oscillators. You can take a lot of, like uh, two springs and mass uh, oscillating, and we are putting some uh, a small spring in the middle to couple these two masses. Okay, but now you should remember this is uh, no harmonic. Okay. 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 Now uh, the part that uh, I was telling you guys before. Why do we need uh, superconducting circuits? Because we don't want dissipation in our device. We want something that uh, we can put current and we can uh, have the system at low temperature passing currents without dissipation. When we have dissipation, you are losing your signal. You're losing your information inside of your system. So the superconducti superconductivity is because of that. And the good part that you can describe uh, the behavior of all the electrons, all the superconducting uh, behavior as a, a wave function, as a wave function that can uh, describe a unique system. You don't have to worry about all the superconductivity inside of the details of superconductivity. You can think about, I have a wave function describing all the letters of the one side of my circuit, one uh, wave function describing all the letters in the other side of the circuit. I don't have to worry about the details of superconductivity in the circuit. Okay. So this is why superconductivity is important, because you, you not have dissipation about the currents and voltage is flowing in your system. But that's not why we are going to uh, work with this device at low temperature. We are going to work with the device with low, very low temperature because uh, the quantum state we are trying to measure has energies much lower than uh, room temperature. We are trying to look at uh, small energy that's around uh, 50 millik. Um, so if you wanted to see a, see a signal that has energy around 50 millik, that's around one gigahertz, five giga, one, 50 millik, I think is one gigahertz of frequency, okay? So basically, you wanna see something that has five gigahertz of energy. So it need to be a temperature really low to be able to see this kind of signal on top of your high frequency, uh, of your uh, background, that's room temperature. So what you do? You put this at really low temperature, use superconductivity to reduce all the dissipation, and then you reduce even more the temperature to be the, the temperature not uh, modify the state of your system. So that's why we are going to use the system at temperatures of uh, 10, 20 millik. So the effect of temperature on the state I'm trying to measure, I'm trying to work, is really small. Is some value that I can control, I know the effect I ha you have that in my uh, quantum state. Okay, now let's start to think about how this circuit works. 
you guys already know that we have uh, capacitors, inductors, resistors, and diodes, and uh, current sources, uh, voltage sources, and RF microwave sources that we use to work on uh, semiconductor uh, chips. And with this kind of device, we can think, how can we work with that, th those devices when we are in a uh, quantum environment? When we, we have quantum properties working on those devices? So we, we will start to uh, think about a little bit about how will be the quantum behavior of these devices. First one is the capacitor. You can think that you have extra uh, pair of uh, extra pair of pairs in one side of the capacitor or the other side. And the superposition will be the pair is shared between the two, both sides of the uh, capacitor. And the, the, uh, the case of the inductor. You have an inductor here, the current flow in one direction, and the current flowing in the opposite direction. So this is the idea of what's the, this, the superposition state we, we will have in this kind of devices. And you can go get the uh, equations of movement of those devices, write down, start to work on that, and do the classical uh, quantization of the circuit, and see that you can write this as a harmonic, quantum harmonic oscillator. And let me show you the idea of how we do that. So remember here, here we have uh, some kind of source that you give a uh, signal to this LC circuit here. And you can write the Lagrangian describing the, this circuit. Uh, the inductor here and the capacitor here, okay, they connect on the potential energy of the device. We uh, uh, use uh, conservation of charge. You write the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation of the circuit here. You see what's the conjugate uh, moment to the charge, the flux, and we write the home term of the circuit. Okay. You see, that's basically what you guys do in uh, classical mechanics. Okay. But they, now we are using uh, inductors and capacitors to do the same, uh, the same calculations. You have the equations of motion. You do the uh, canonical commutation here, and you can write the Hamiltonian describing the behavior of the circuit. And you can see here, the behavior of the circuit is the same behavior you have in a harmonic oscillator, a quantum harmonic oscillator here. So now you show that, OK, we can think about uh, LC circuit as a harmonic oscillator. Now, because we are physicists, we need to see if this is true. Let's see if we can uh, create uh, an electromagnetic cavity and the behaviors we have f uh, of this cavity in the, these conditions that we have low temperature, uh, where the quantum behavior can uh, uh, be seen, exist. And that's what we try to do. We uh, create a circuit that is a LC circuit. And in this case, is this Coplanar wave guide, for example. We can do with other kinds of circuit. We can make, we, we can make an inductor and capacitor circuit and do the same kind of experiment. What do we do here? We send some signal inside of this LC circuit here, this resonator. And we, are, we, we put atom here inside of the cavity to interact with this, um, the microwave we have inside of the cavity. And then we do a spectroscopy of the atom to see what's the state we have inside of the atom. Similar with what the guys did when they had the mirror here. With the electromagnetic field, they got some atoms. they pass the atoms through the cavity. So you create some kind of state here. You pass the atom to the uh, system. The atom interact with the cavity. Then the atom arrives here. 
Then you do some kind of spectroscopy here of the atom to see what's the state of the atom. When you do that, you can you measure something like that here or something like what we see here. Okay, this is the same kind of measurement seen in diff uh, different ways. And each one of these peaks here correspond to a different uh, state of a current state inside of the cavity. So you can create inside of this uh, harmonic oscillator that uh, you build using a LC circuit, a, a quantum state inside of the device. So you, we are showing that, okay, this kind of circuit has a quantum behavior as we expect. Okay. And here are other measurement, making a different configuration that we did before. Okay. So this kind of LSC circuit has a quantum behavior, and we can create inside of the cavity here other kinds of uh, more interesting uh, states that we want to create uh, do quantum computation. Okay. You can start to uh, think about other fog states that we can create inside of the system to do that. Okay. So, uh, why do we need to use an uh, artificial atom here? Okay. Why this is important for us? And what we do here? Okay. When you see you have this LC circuit, each one of the energy levels of the device has the same uh, difference of energy between, for example, between E1, E, E2. You have a difference of energy E21. 2 and 3, E3, 3, 2. All of these differences of energies here are the same. It's a harmonic oscillator, that's what we expect, that's what we see. When we have uh, atomic uh, energy levels, you guys know that the difference of energy between different states are different. You can have one equal to the other, but that's not normal. Normally, they are totally different one of the other. So these energy levels are different. Okay? You guys understand that you, this is something that you had on your uh, quantum course. But now, think about, I'm going to measure this device. And I need to uh, send signals to the device <coughs> to... Uh, uh, make these transitions from this, this level to that level. And I cannot send one photon here. I'm going to send one photon to do this transition here, from here to here. And I have a probability to the photon to arrive here and to make this transition. It would be really hard to do that. It's really complex to do that. So what we do, we go there and throw billions of photons there to do this transition. When we do that, in this kind of circuit here, this LC circuit, we are going to uh, one photon do this transition, other, other photon arrives here and do this, that and transition, and then in the end, you, you have no idea where you are in this kind of circuit here. You have no idea where you are. But when you send uh, billions of photons, but with this specific frequency here, E21, you only do, uh, make this transition between this state to that state. That state E2 to E3, we are not going to uh, make any transition there. So you can control uh, the transition you're, you are uh, probing in your circuit. Because in the beginning, you, as that idea we have in the book that ah, I'm one photon will arrive here and do this transition. That's what, 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 what happened in nature. You are going to send many photons there, and then you are going to um, only probe this transition here. Okay. This, uh, the photon can uh, induce this transition here, but will not in induce that transition here. So in this way, we have a qubit here. You have a, a system, then you have these two states that you can uh, use now as a, cube, as a qubit here. Okay. Okay. Now it's 10, 4, I think we can stop now. And tomorrow, I will start from Josephson Junctions and explain a little bit uh, about how this kind of system works. Okay? One, any questions? Thank questions? You. Nice. Yeah, thank you very much.
any questions? Uh, thank you for thank you for the lesson, Professor. I I have a doubt because uh, when you show the comparison between your your ammonic oscillator energy levels and the atomic energy levels, uh, we sure. got an issue in, in an atom because not all levels are equally stable. Yeah, you get the phenomena of of spontaneous emission and. Any others? You get uh, similar issues in your yep. LC circuit. Yep. Uh, well, you can excite any state here. You can throw photons and excite, for example, E4. After some time, you have some decay, and then you start to lose uh, the energy for the environment. That's what uh, um, we are trying to explain. Here. That kappa here, the cap to the K. All of that uh, that we are put inside of this K here. You have really complex models to explain this K. Okay? You can look at uh, Caldera Legge, for example, and go from there. I, I am not, not going to do that because we don't need. I use the Limbladian, put a constant that you uh, solve all my problems there and go from there. But there are many theoretical groups and experimental groups that are trying to understand better how that happens. Okay? But basically, in our LC circuit, the environment is so big, the, uh, our cavity is so big, and is interacting with every, everything around that you have any problem there. You have some defects, some dirt around your sample, then you can uh, see this uh, inducing uh, some loss on your device. And I can see uh, electrons uh, in, the, in the surface of my uh, silicon. So I, when I do a spectroscopy of my qubit, I can see the qubit interacting with all the dirt, all the defects I have in the uh, crystalline structure of the silicon. And there are different ways to uh, study that. One of the ways that guys most part of the time use is to think about two level systems uh, in a surface and then they are interacting with the electromagnetic field of the atom. And because of that, we uh, have some ways to understand better what happened there. But there are other techniques you can look on the internet or talk with some uh, other researchers that study specifically this kind of uh, uh, system. Okay. okay, thank you. More questions? Hi. Hello. So I was wondering, is uh, circuit QED completely analogous to cavity QED? Can you do all the same things? or are Yeah, the Hampton will be the same. So, OK. Yeah, you, can assume, you can use the same uh, physics. Uh, you have one uh, system in the other. The, uh, the way you uh, operate the both systems experimentally is different. But the Hamilton is describing the behavior of both systems is the same. Yes, no, I mean, if physically in the lab is more convenient to use one or the other, or? Here in Brazil is much more common uh, cavity QED. CIRQED, I think I'm the only group in Brazil. There are other groups around the world that do that, in the United States, uh, Europe, uh, China, but Brazil, I think, I'm, I'm thinking the only one that's yeah. doing that here. You and now Ivan Yeah, I, I'm, I'm working with Ivan, so I help the guys to project their uh, DR and the, their refrigerator and the machines they are buying. I'm helping the guys to do the lab there. Oh. I, I guess there is a difference when you go to the strong coupling regime, because in cavity QEG, it's really hard to, to Arrive there, this, yeah. This regime, but in your case, it's, it's easier. easier to arrive to this. But the you guys in uh, QD did all the calculations for everything. Uh, the yeah, theory uh, groups are much uh, more advanced than us uh, in the experimental field. But but the master question changes when we try to describe the dissipation. Change, right? Yeah, there are some differences. But I think the, 
I, I'm trying to answer that. The basic idea is the same. You have specifics from the, uh, the two fields, but the basic idea is the same. If you understand one, you understand the other, you only have to adjust because of the experimental details, one of the other, okay? Uh, in another platform, we have problem in order to improve the, or, or uh, increase the number of qubits. For example, in, in NMR techniques, for example. But uh, my question, my question is, in, in this platform, superconducting qubit, uh, why we don't have this this kind of limit in order to in, uh, increase the number of qubits? Uh, uh, make, uh, to make qubits uh, using uh, the techniques we have here that are uh, semiconductor techniques, I can make like one billion junctions easily. Mm -hmm. uh, I can put on, uh, make a mask and use the processing you use for uh, semiconductor technology and make one billion of junctions there. But I, uh, the hardest part is how to control that. The problem in superconducting qubits is to control all of those devices. And because they start to interact one with the other, they start with interacting with the environment, so this is the hardest part. But the idea here is that do you, uh, the control is the part that's limiting this field right now. Because they start to have, uh, to build more complex circuits to accommodate all the lines, all the uh, kinds of circuits you need to isolate each one of the qubits and couple them when you want. But make m many qubits is not hard. The problem is how to control the qubits in a way that, the way you want. Only make qubits does really help you in, the, in, the, in that moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sam Professor for the presentation. Uh, just some if I say that the temperature have to be lower than the energy gap of the qubit, because yep. I think that uh, it's a desirable condition, but not ne a necessary condition, because uh, you can measure the state of the qubit with uh, higher states, right? Mm. No, you can't, because uh, you're... Some guys try to use the uh, third state here, to measure the qubit, but higher states, is, they're, not, they're not possible to use that. Because you, you want, because the states here, the difference of energy between these two states be really small. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, excite, try to excite this, try to use these two states here as a qubit, you put a, a electron here, and because of the thermal energy, they will be populated this E4. Yes, but that type of uh, length for example, the length of the qubit is specifically to a transmon uh, uh, architecture, right? But, but in another different type of superconducting qubit, like for example, in a fluxonium. You can use a fluxonium, have... but it's harder to control a fluxonium. Because oh, well. there much more, more energy levels. Hmm. It's not simple to control, because you have these energy levels with uh, like 400, 300 megahertz in fluxoniums. But to access these states and to control these states is much harder than to control uh, this state here in transmon. Mm -hmm. So we use the X1 transmon or similar in this case. But that's why you guys prefer to use this kind of, uh, lower the temperature, and then use much more simple control, then try to improve, mm -hmm. uh, okay, let uh, the temperature a little bit loose, and try to control with uh, other kinds of qubits, for example, of glucosonium that has these uh, lower energy levels. You have trade off trades that you have to worry about. Yes, there are groups working on that. Mm. And this is really interesting to work with fluxonium. But when you have like 400 uh, fluxoniums there, we start to have uh, like a mass inside and we start to have more complex system. Yeah, yeah. This is a good question. I, there are some groups working on, with this kind of circuit. I'm not reading the, what they are doing right now. I think to use one or two fluxoniums to do some kind of uh, works, but it's not for, more for uh, fundamentals of quantum mechanics, try to see uh, classical uh, quantum uh, transitions, this kind of stuff. To quantum computation now, I think the easiest way for lower number of qubits, you use a transmon x that are more simple to work, 
then you start to have a more in engineering problem that you have to solve. It's a little bit off physics topic. OK. OK, thank you. Uh, you said you're using niobium to do the the chips, yep. and uh, there's something about the niobium that makes you uh, think of it, or you could do uh, you could use graphene or another like TMD or something like oh. to have the same properties. Oh, let's try to use uh, simple superconducting materials: niobium, alumi aluminum. Tungsten, this kind of uh, superconductors that is used is fabricated. And the case that we are using aluminum because aluminum has a higher TC than aluminum. So the idea that when you are cooling down your device, you have magnetic fields in the universe, and some magnetic fields can be trapped inside of your superconductor. When you trap a vortex, a magnetic vortex inside of your superconductor film you have some uh, region that you create quasi-particles. You break the copper pairs, and then these quasi-particles will interact with the, uh, your qubit, and you increase the coherence of your system. So there is some technical problems uh, to use different kinds of uh, superconductors. One idea is to use a shield of lead and niobium and use the circuit inside as uh, aluminum. So the first uh, transition uh, from normal to superconductor is the niobium and lead that will kind of make a Faraday uh, cage from, for your uh, sample. Then when you have the second transition, you don't have a magnetic field inside. But this is more technical problems here. Okay, okay thank you. More questions? I guess this is not the case. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Francisco, for the, the nice talk. It was very interesting to see the your journey to the oh, to build the last week, setup. Yeah, uh, the, the last experience. week the source that uh, make the junk, the qubits just broke, uh -huh. and now I need to find uh, ten thousand dollars to buy a new one. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, there's an experimental life. We always have problems in the yeah, lab. Yeah. But this is interesting, the experimental life, because I don't know who is experimentalist here. A few, only, I guess. But uh, it's a hard job. Really yeah. Hard. The machines are built to work in a really specific uh, region of parameters. When some of the parameters uh, move from that uh, set setup, you have problems. Mm -hmm. So. And nature doesn't care about what we think about. They, nature do what they do, and we have to live with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, we have thank the you coffee. again. Okay. We have the coffee break now, and uh, after lunch we have the talk by Professor Marcus Marcus Heinrich from Stockholm, and also the talk by Professor Ivan, the colleague of Professor Rochinol from Rio de Janeiro, and today we have the conference dinner. Don't forget it. It's uh, half past seven in the evening. So Umberto sent you already the, the location, the, how to reach there. So let's see.